Hi, today we're going to talk about the basic structure of the atom and how we learned about it. I like talking about the history for this part of chemistry because it really helps us to understand how people came up with theories and then tested them. So again, if you watched my intro to chemistry video and we talked about the cooking analogy, what we're dealing with here is what ingredients we are working with. So as I mentioned in that video, people started figuring out what elements there were, but they wanted to understand why were some elements different from others. And so they started experimenting with different elements doing all sorts of interesting things to them. So let's start out with J.J. Thompson. So this is way back in the late 1890s. People had come up with these things that they called cathode ray tubes. And so basically what these were, where they had a tube which was under reasonable vacuum, so very little air left inside, and then they would run electricity through it. Now, if you do this, you tend not to see anything at all. The, the electricity does flow somehow. Um, but if you put a phosphorescent background in, something that glows, you can actually see a line of something going across. Well, what J.J. Thompson did with this was he tried putting a magnet up against the cathode ray tube. And what he found is that the ray of whatever it was that was in the cathode ray tube was attracted to or repelled from, depending on which pole of the magnet he was using, you know, to the magnet. So something in there was charged. So what J.J. Thompson deduced from this was that there were small particles that had a negative electric charge that existed somewhere. Now, he, and he called these particles corpuscles, which always makes me think of blood, but uh, whatever. So that's what it was for the first however many years. And so people talked about these particles that had a negative charge. And so what Robert Millikan did then, and you can see this was over 10 years later, was he wanted to figure out how these negatively charged particles behaved and what he could find out about their behavior. So what he did was this, he had this thing up in the corner is an atomizer. The old fashioned perfume spray bottles used to have these things on them. And basically it takes a liquid and it, it turns it into a fine spray. So he would atomize droplets of oil. So what he did was he figured out the mass of each oil droplet that came out of his atomizer. Once he had done that, what he did was he put in these charged plates. So he hooked up an electric field with, to these metal plates. And you could see that the top plate had a positive charge. The bottom plate had a negative charge. The top plate also had a very small hole that would allow oil droplets to come through. So the oil droplets were just coming through in one place. And as they came through, he bombarded them with x-rays. And those x-rays, if they hit an oil droplet, they would give them a negative charge. So what he found was the regular droplets fell at a certain rate and the negatively charged droplets were repelled somewhat from the negative plate. So they fell more slowly. And so based on the speed at which different droplets fell, he was able to calculate the charge on those oil droplets. And from this, he was able to determine the mass to charge ratio of an electron. So all this time, J.J. Thompson had been thinking about his corpuscles. And what he came up with was a model of how he thought atoms and matter in general must look like. This model was based on the fact that since negatively charged particles had been discovered, there must also be something that was positively charged. Because nature just does not allow large amounts of charge buildup to occur without trying to neutralize those charge buildups. So the model that Thompson proposed was something that he called a plum pudding model. Now, this is a name that is very evocative if you're British, and if you're not, um, you have no idea what a plum pudding is. A plum pudding is kind of a bready thing with bits of fruit in it. And the closest thing that we might have in the United States is a blueberry muffin. So 
Thompson's idea was that the bread part was a sort of positively charged mass and then embedded in that positively charged mass were bits of negatively charged what he called corpuscles remember um, basically like little fruit bits with negative charges well how could you know if that was the case a few years later ernest rutherford decided to do an experiment to prove or disprove that hypothesis that thompson had made and he did this using what we call his gold foil experiment so this was 1911 again that's about five years after the Thompson plum pudding model. So basically the reason he used gold is because you can hammer gold down to be a very, very thin sheet that in fact ends up being only a few atoms thick. So he basically took a really fine sheet of gold and then he hit it with a stream of radioactive particles that people back then called alpha particles. We will talk more about this when we hit chapter 22. So alpha particles, the only thing that people knew about them was that they were positively charged. So what Rutherford was going to do here was he was going to send the stream of alpha particles at the gold foil. Of course, when you have a hypothesis that you're trying to test, you have to ask yourself what will happen if this hypothesis is correct. Well, if you have this huge positively charged thing with only small amounts of negative charge embedded through it, then what's going to happen when you have a positively charged thing is the positive charge is going to approach the positively charged thing and be repelled because things that have the same charge repel from each other and things that have opposite charges attract to each other. So what would that look like in the gold foil experiment? Um, so what Rutherford did was he surrounded the gold foil with a detector that only had a small hole in it to allow the alpha particles to enter. And if this gold foil was mostly positively charged stuff, then what would happen is things would reflect back off of it. So the positively charged things would come in, they'd hit the positively charged stuff, and they'd bounce back. Now, what actually did happen? Well, there was a little bit of backscatter, but a lot of the particles seemed to make it through. Now, some of them went off at different angles, but the majority of them actually went straight through and hit directly on the other side from where the alpha particles originally came in. Now, what did this mean? So what Rutherford decided that this meant was that most of the atom is empty space and you have these little tiny areas of positively charged something so that if you put a bunch of different alpha particles through some will go sailing all the way through and won't encounter anything positively charged but there are those tiny little parts that are positively charged and so some alpha particles will hit the positive parts straight on and be deflected back and others will come close and will sort of be deflected. And that's why we see those things going through, but deflected off at an angle. So this is the way that Rutherford figured out approximately what the structure of the atom looked like. So basically we have a small positively charged area that we call the nucleus. And this contains two different types of nuclear particles. Um, the generic term for nuclear particles is nucleons. And the rest of it is mostly empty space with occasional negatively charged particles called electrons. Now we're going to look at the structure of where the electrons exist in the next chapter. Uh, but for now, let's just go through and let's talk about these different particles that make up the atom. So the first thing we're going to talk about are the nucleons and we're going to start off with the protons. The protons have a positive charge. All of the protons exist in the nucleus, so they are nucleons. The mass is 1.6, approximately times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, which is tiny. But the important thing about protons is the number of protons in an atom help determine the chemical properties of that atom. So when we go through and we start talking about the periodic table, on the periodic table, you will see there are these numbers in the upper left corner in this particular periodic table. Those refer to the number of protons 
for a given element. So in this particular case, beryllium has four protons. Now, one thing you should understand is that elements generally do not change into other elements. Elements usually stay the same. And the reason this is, is because in order to change an element from one to the other, you'd actually have to take away, or put on for that matter, protons from the nucleus. You would have to give the nucleus a smaller number of protons or give it a larger number of protons, and that's actually really hard. As a result, elements do not change to other elements, and this is basically why alchemists could never change gold into lead. Now you'll notice that I have an asterisk in here, and that asterisk I'm just going to say usually, because if you stick around till chapter 22, you'll see that elements sometimes do change to other elements. The second type of nucleon is a neutron. And this is basically a particle that has no charge, or you could think of it as a neutral charge. It is about the same mass as a proton, but just slightly heavier. But the thing about neutrons, most people ask is why do we need neutrons? So let me give you an analogy. And this is a picture of my oldest three children. Um, when my third child was born, we had this old Toyota Camry, and we did squeeze all three of them in the back seat for several years. And technically this worked, but the problem was that they were all really squished in there close to each other. And so while they're all happy and smiling in this picture, once we started driving, there was a lot of elbowing and pushing and mom, he touched me, he touched me, he touched me. We hoped that they would outgrow that, but they didn't. What we ended up doing was we ended up buying a van where there were two back seats. And so we could keep people separate. And then what we would do when we had to have two people sitting on the same seat was we'd put an ice chest in between them or something big like that. And because there was something in between, it was a lot harder to elbow things out of the way. So you could think of neutrons this way. If you have two protons right next to each other, they both have a positive charge. And we know from what we've been talking about that positive charges, if you try and push them together, they'll push themselves apart. You can go and try this with your refrigerator magnets if you have some good strong refrigerator magnets. As you push them closer and closer together, the closer they get together, the harder they push apart. So you don't want them too close together. How do you keep protons spaced apart? By adding something without a positive charge in between. And that's what neutrons are for, to help stabilize the atom. The third type of subatomic particle is an electron. Electrons have a negative charge, as we've already discussed. These were the corpuscles that uh, Thompson discovered. The electrons are spread in a large volume around the nucleus, not because they themselves are large, but because they just move really fast. And again, we're going to be talking about electrons a lot in the future. Electrons are super tiny. They're about one two thousandth of the mass of a proton. So remember that a proton was about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms. So electrons are like 10 to the minus 30th of a kilogram. And the reason that electrons end up being important is that they are responsible for actually holding molecules together. And that's really what we're going to be talking a lot about in chapter two. So if you want to build an atom, basically you're going to take enough protons to make the right element. So there are your protons. You're going to add enough neutrons to keep it from falling apart. And then you're going to add enough electrons to keep it from having a charge. So basically making it electrically neutral is what we call it. Now, it's true that you don't have to have electrically neutral atoms. In fact, we'll talk a lot about ions, but we usually start off that way. So there are the electrons. You can see here we had two protons, so we're going to have two electrons. So one of the questions people ask is, how many neutrons do you need to add in order to make an atom stable? And the answer is, it kind of depends. And so this is something that we will talk a bit more about in chapter 22. But basically, you can have different numbers of neutrons for a given element. And the more protons you have, the more neutrons you need. So if you look at this graph, the x-axis is the number of neutrons, the y-axis is the number of protons, and there's this line right here where the number of protons equals the number of neutrons. 
And you can see that for lower numbers of protons, the number of neutrons you need is about the same as the number of protons. But then as you get up to higher and higher numbers of protons, you need more neutrons than protons. Okay, so quick summary. For our basic atomic particles, we have our two nucleons, protons, which are heavy particles with a positive charge. And basically those help us figure out what element we have. Neutrons are heavy particles with no charge. Those help to stabilize atoms. And then finally, outside the nucleus, we have our electrons, which are very light particles with a negative charge. So the reason we need to understand atomic structure is that it helps us understand why different elements have different chemical properties, why different elements interact with each other differently, etc. Before we dive more deeply into these concepts, you really need to have a strong understanding of basic atomic structure. I hope this was helpful and I look forward to seeing you again soon.